How's it going, everyone? Ponyo here. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of After Dinner Mint. Before we begin, I want to encourage everyone watching to join us in the Artblox Discord, which is where all of our community lives. I'm talking about collectors, artists, future generative artists, if you're just interested in generative art, and all that. So if, if you're interested in any of those categories, join us on the Artbox Discord. We'll love, we would love to you know, point you in the right direction and uh, yeah, help you mint or you know, learn about generative art. Uh, make sure you like, comment, and subscri subscribe to our YouTube channel so you don't miss an episode of our weekly show. And now I want to introduce our guest for the evening. We have Artblox founder and generative artist, Snowfro. Hey, everybody. Uh, we have technologist, author, designer, and generative artist, Josh Davis, AKA PlayStation. Hello. And then we also have Artblox collector, community leader, and volunteer of the Artblox wiki page, Noel Flicker. Hey, everyone. Cool, and we're gonna get straight to it. Uh, I want to talk to Josh first. Uh, well, welcome. How are you doing today? Uh, better. You know, we had the drop today, and uh, I'm now, I've, I've smoked a cigar. I've had a cup of coffee. I've had <laughs> Eric yell at me. <laughs> I'm, I'm good. I'm in a much Excellent. better place. He, he's good. shaking his head like, Davis. <laughs> <laughs> well, we appreciate you spending time here to talk to the community and, you know, about your Thanks. project and your background. Um, so first, I want to ask you, you know, can you tell us a little bit about your background when it comes to the art world? Yeah, so I, I grew up in Littleton, Colorado. Um, I actually went to Columbine High School. Um, and I lived two blocks from Columbine High School. That's where I graduated in, in 90. Um, and, you know, when I was in high school, I was, you know, really active in, in art. I've been doing art since I was 12. Went to Catholic school, you know, like really, really young. And the nuns like called my parents and they were like, you know, you should really nurture art. This, this kid's got like a really knack for, for doing stuff. And so I think they bought my first like oil painting set when I was like 12, oh, wow. <laughs> you know, I was like, I'll be over here with the turpentine. <laughs> and so uh, in high school, I entered a statewide painting competition and uh, took second place in the state of Colorado for painting. And um, I was just like, well, you know, it's it's time to go to New York, you know, because that's where Basquiat is. That's where Warhol is. And so in 1992, um, I packed up all my stuff and uh, moved to New York and uh, went to uh, and went to Pratt. So um, I was actually in their um, fine art program as a, as a painter. And uh, and then obviously we can we can talk about how, you know, computers how that whole journey sort of unfolded, but that's kind of prior to computers okay. um, getting into yeah. art. I, yeah, I want to jump right into, you know, how did you get sure. into generative art? And then, you know, how did you learn about the Artblocks platform? Yeah, so, you know, I, I basically funded my own way through school. And uh, so I was trying to get a, a job on campus, you know, to help pay like rent uh, in Brooklyn where I lived. And they were like, uh, well, we've got one of the, like, the highest paying jobs on campus. Uh, campus is um, uh, public, doing uh, the website for, for pratt.edu. Do you know how to build websites? And I was like, absolutely. I had no idea. <laughs> and so I bought this like 400 page book on writing HTML and JavaScript for Netscape 2. Uh, read it like in a couple of days. And I, you know, my first foray in computers was I found some on the street. Um, there's uh, this place that was like throwing out, they must've been like upgrading computers. So they were throwing out all these computers on the street. So I like picked up this like 286, like Pentium PC that had like a, at that time screens came in two colors, either amber or green. And, uh, and mine was amber. And so, you know, here I am like, quickly trying to learn HTML and JavaScript so that I could, you know, help build Pratt's website. And during the day, I'm like, you know, doing the normal, you know, art uh, painting stuff. And then at night, I'm like self teaching myself computers, and I couldn't afford a Mac, I, I didn't really know much about PCs. And you'll, you'll see where this folds in a little bit later. But um, uh, I ended up getting turned on to Linux. So my first operating system for maybe the first couple of years was actually uh, Slackware Linux because you could buy the book for like $30 and they had a CD at the back of the book that had the operating system. And so that whole idea of like, 
um, community and open source kind of like helping you like recompile your kernel so that it will work with your sound card. Like that was very much a part of the Linux community and that later will fold into um, how I sort of embrace open source um, uh, in the late 90s, or early, early 2000s. Um, in terms of art blocks, um, you know, my last like really big NFT project was a Christie's auction. So, um, you know, Beeple got me into NFTs um, pretty early on in the year. He was just like, hey, you should check out this NFT thing that's happening. I think you do really well at it. And uh, I was like, yeah, OK. You know, and I'd been crypto for a while. Um, I actually built an Ethereum miner here in my studio. Oh, wow. And that's because back in 2017, I was looking for like a project, 2017, 2018. I was looking for a project to get, you know, like back into Linux. And it ends up that these crypto miners ran on command line Linux. So I ended up and I had you know, because I do visuals, I had like, you know, 11 GPU cards. So back in 2017, 2018, I built this miner here in the studio and was like mining Ethereum just as a hobby, like a, a weekend hobby. Um, but NFTs was relatively new for me until like January of, of this year because of Beeple. And, you know, I ended up saying like, you know, because of the Christie's auction, I said, you know, it's kind of a shame that I do generative art um, and I'm having to render, you know, all my processing sketches to to MP4 when, you know, really these want to run real time. They want to run they want to run live. And so uh, I think it was either Brendan Dawes or Casey or somebody were like, you really should check out the art blocks platform. And so when I checked it out, Casey had just done his drop. And then um, I was just kind of like, OK, wow, you know, it's it's process, it's it's P5JS. So it's not quite as robust as I'm used to doing, because now I'm mostly doing, you know, pure processing with GLSL shaders. Um, but it was it, your the platform is incredible. I mean, it's 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 everything that I've been preaching about generative art, about, you know, uh, feeling bad about capturing you know, these NFTs to MP4s when they really want to, they really want to just live. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. Excellent. Cool. I appreciate you sharing that. Uh, so the next set of questions I, I received, I, I sourced them out from several other artists on our platform, just because I, a lot of them are super excited to have you on the Artblocks platform. Uh, so the first question is, since you've been killing it with client work, how would you compare working with a client to doing your own artwork? Yeah. So, you know, I've been doing, you know, again, digital art since 1995. And it was maybe 10 or 15 years ago, I was in Barcelona, Spain with Seth, Stefan Sagmeister. And I'm, I'm having lunch with him. And I said, Stefan, uh, I think, you know, and we were doing this conference in front of like 3000 people. And I said, Stefan, you know, I get up on stage and I look out over the audience and I see people with like Louis Vuitton bags. He's like, I think people in the audience make more money than I do. And Stefan says, yeah, they do. They do. And I was like, oh, <laughs> and he's like, but they're probably unhappy. And he's like, you know, so you have a choice. You know, you could start a studio and you could, you know, make buckets of money, but you'll probably be pretty unhappy because you won't actually be making the work. So you have a, like a real choice. Like you can live humbly and, um, you know, only make like a certain amount of money a year but you'll get to do the kind of things that you want to work on. And so, you know, I really took that to heart. And so for like the past 10 or 15 years or so, I maybe only do like one or three corporate projects a year. And that's really just to make enough money to like pay my mortgage so that I can really kind of work on this stuff and all this weird stuff behind me. So, um, you know, the, the, the brand work is, you know, obviously if, if you've done brand work, you know, there are sacrifices. You're working with a team. There, there are challenges. Like, you know, I've done stuff for Pepsi at the Super Bowl. They've got colors that you got to use. They've got restrictions yeah. that you have to use. And as a designer, not an artist, you can use those challenges to, you know, to, 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 to try to come up with something exciting. But if you're coming from a, like a pure art aesthetic, which is what I do when I'm not doing, you know, corporate work, um, you know, I get to kind of pick the forms and the colors and the things that excite me. And so, you know, I, I guess I'll fast forward. And this is why this NFT thing, I think, is a real blessing for, for most of us is, is like what happened today because of all of you has helped me not have to do those one or three, you know, corporate projects for the year. And I can really just focus on, you know, the stuff that um, that you love that I find that I love. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like it's 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 
amazing. Yeah, Absolutely I love amazing. that. And that kind of relates to the next question. Uh, you know, now that sure. NFTs are giving more artists an incredible opportunity to make a living of their art, do you think it will influence client work? You know, do you think clients will be like, all right, well, you know, maybe the artist should be able to have more influence of, of what the final outcome would look? Yeah, you know, I gave this talk at 99U a couple of years ago, and the whole point of that talk was is that, you know, client work, their only frame of reference is stuff that has already existed. And it's not necessarily where you necessarily want to be going, right? Mm -hmm. And so they may look at something that you did six months ago and go, yeah, c can we have something like that? But we want to change this and we want to change that. So it's it becomes like a really tricky thing to do. So I think the nice thing that has occurred is, is that, you know, NFTs allow me to sort of explore the things that I'm super interested in so that you're, you're putting out work that kind of is ahead of what clients are willing to do. Because again, again, their frame of reference could be something that you did six months ago. So will it ultimately influence client work if I choose to, to do it? I would think so. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, 100%. Cool. Awesome. Uh, so you've been at the forefront of new media art and generative art for ages. Can you think of any other revolution of that scale that's happened in that field? Well, so that's the funny thing is uh, when we did the Christie's auction, you know, there were two really good dear friends of mine, Aria Harvey and Leah. And those two were... Uh, people that I met in a really old school project back in 1998 called hell.com. And hell was just us doing like net art. It was a place for us to kind of like use the internet as a canvas, use the technology of computers and browsers and the web as, you know, the paint, the brush, whatnot. And there was a real sort of like Renaissance moment that like what we were doing was, new, was exciting, had never kind of exist, existed before. And so the progression of that is, is that you had kind of this moment where there was this like explosive growth of people riding a wave that literally had just formed. And then, then the internet got boring. <laughs> the internet got boring for like a long period <laughs> of time. And so, you know, for me personally, who's been around for this long, this feels, I mean, we've had these conversations, me, Aria, and, and uh, Leah have had these conversations about like, oh my God, this, this feels like the excitement and the energy like back in 1998, 1999. So there are, there are extreme parallels in what was happening back then at the, you know, kind of the, and please, there's a huge asterisk here. I know that generative <laughs> art has been around for a long time. The demo scene happened way before us. I'm just, you know, I'm literally just talking about the web as, as a medium. So I would say the, the only other time that this kind of, you know, past six to nine months feels like it did, you know, 25 years ago. Wow. Very cool. Um, mm -hmm. so it looks like, are you in your studio right now? Is that like your design studio? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. This, and it's so funny because I do these like video chats with people and they're like, oh, where'd you get that background? And then people come <laughs> over to visit. And they're like, holy shit, that's really your place. Yeah, <laughs> it looks awesome. So do you have any so, advice? Yeah. Do you have any advice to create a design studio as successful as yours? Like, I'm curious to know what your flow is and, you know, how you organize everything. Yeah, I mean, you know, I've, I've, I've talked about this, you know, for like a long time, which is, you know, the type of work you make is the type of work you'll get hired to do. And, you know, it's, it's if, you, if you're going to follow trends, then you're just a follower of trends. And if you like ignore all of that. And so let me just tell you, my studio didn't always look like this. Like it used to be shelves of like books and magazines. And what I would find is, is I would look at those books and magazines like maybe once or twice and but ultimately, I'd be influenced by the stuff that I would see in those books or magazines. And a lot of time I'd get discouraged because I'd be like, well, I'm not going to do that because it's already been done. Yeah. Or yeah. Um, so what I ended up doing is, is I've got a two story studio. So I ended up moving like all those books and magazines upstairs and putting all of the things that I actually use to be creative here. So like when I open up the door, there literally is this wall of like sensors and arduinos and cameras and connects and markers and paints that almost kind of like screams at you like what are we going to do today yeah what are me and you going to do today <laughs> and so i think surrounding is like really important i think if you can surround your stuff with i can, if you can surround yourself around stuff that enables you to be creative then it it totally opens up that third eye 
And so I had to get rid of books. I had to get rid of magazines. I had to get rid of all of those things that other people had already done. Mm -hmm. And I needed to make a place that was just like a womb, you know, a dark wizard cave that was just like, this is your <laughs> cave. This is where you make dark magic. What, what are we going to make? What are we going to make know? today? I love it. Uh, Casey Reese had a question for you. He would love to know, he would love for you. So I guess uh, for you to talk about opening your source code in the early flash yeah. days, Casey said sure. you were the most open with sharing with others. What was the motivation yeah. behind all that? Yeah. So the funny story about Casey is, is that um, uh, me and Casey worked for a studio back in 1999 called IO360. And it was about 16 of us that, that worked at that studio. And there were three design technologists. There was me, this guy, Rusty, and this guy, Steve. And so we were the programmers. And so there was like a design. So Casey was part of design. And I actually think he'll probably kill me for saying this. I think like <laughs> our first project working together was like the website for Microsoft's Internet Explorer 4. Oh, I think wow. was the project that we worked on together. Awesome. And Casey would come over and be like, you know, can you move that over one pixel? Like, can you move <laughs> that up one pixel? Like he was my designer. And uh, Casey came over to us one day and he said, you know, I think I'm going to take continuing education classes on programming. And I think it was at NYU at the time. And we were like, oh, okay, Casey, like, great. You know, and he'd come in and he'd show like these, 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 you know, exercises that he would do. And then like a month later, he's like, yeah, I put in my two weeks notice. I think I'm going to go to MIT and, and work with John Maida. <laughs> and the three of us were just like, what is happening? <laughs> and so, you know, we, we literally watched Casey. I literally watched Casey become Casey. Wow. And amazing. in terms of the open source thing, it, it goes back to Linux. You know, like the Linux community is very open about others helping you use that particular environment. Like, you know, if you've got a new video card, you've got a new sound card okay, you know, there's somebody in the community that's willing to show you how to recompile the kernel in order to get, you know, certain things to work. So this idea of like open sharing benefits everybody. Well, at the time when Flash came out and when I started using Flash, it wasn't called Flash, it was called Future Splash Animator. And eventually Macromedia bought it and then it became Flash One and, and so on and so forth. Well, that, you know, for people who don't know, Flash was kind of the environment where you worked in a source code environment called an FLA. That FLA would get compiled to a Swift. A Swift was the thing that you could embed on a website. And so it hid. It hid like almost how to do everything. And at the time, I was working on a project called PlayStation, and I was like putting up these like little experiments. You know, much like uh, you know, Beeple does his every days. Mm -hmm. I was kind of doing every days, but to learn code. Like because again, I was a, I was a painter. I, I did not. I don't have a background in computer science, so I literally had to self teach myself programming. Like what is modulo? You know, I had to. <laughs> what is uh, you know multi dimensional arrays? Like I had to self teach myself all this stuff. Wow. And so as I was doing stuff in Flash, I literally because Flash was kind of like a hot technology at the time. I would literally get like hundreds of emails from people like, how did you do this? 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 And so because of the Linux community, I was just like, well, here's a zip file with the FLA. And so I literally started open sourcing everything that I did. And so it stopped a lot of the emails because, <laughs> yeah. you know, I didn't have to like answer like, how did you do that? How did you do this? So I was like giving away the source code. But, but if you know anything about open source, what happens is, is that people will take those files they'll add on to it and give it back to you. And so then huh. I would put I would put out like a seed idea and well heck I would get that seed idea back with like 50 mutations. And so I was learning from others like okay so that's how you do easing equations. And so I learned very quickly that that the value of open source is is that I'm sharing things but people would then give it back to me and then I would only, you know, learn and, and progress faster. Were there, so it sounded like, you know, obviously the pros of, you know, sharing your, your source code with others is, yeah, you don't have to respond to all those emails, saves you a lot of time. Were there any cons, like so many negatives that came from that? Oh, I mean, we've seen that over the course of 25 years where, you know, brands will come to artists and say, hey, we want to use this for a brand thing. And the artists will say no, and they'll take the source code and do it anyway. So, you know, we've seen that happen multiple times. Um, but, you know, again... I think that's just the nature of, of giving code away. But the funny thing that happens too is, is that, you know, uh, brands will say, well, we, tr we've tried to use your open source and we can't figure out how to do it. And then they would end up hiring me anyway. So, so 
yeah, there was some negatives. You know, I, I think the one that I can think of the most was um, the uh, the laser graffiti thing. I think there was a brand that wanted to to to, to do someone's you know, laser graffiti project, and some brand ended up stealing it because the, the code was open source. So those negative things are going to happen. But the positives far outweigh any of those horror stories. Uh-huh. Right on. Well, uh, Schwembelder mentioned to me that they are on our blocks as a generative artist because of you, uh, that yeah. you brought on Skillshare. Yeah. You know, how did you yeah. record these and how successful was the project? Yeah, so I did uh, three classes on Skillshare. One was called Introdu- Introduction to Generative Art. The second one was Introduction to Generative Animation. And the third one was painting with sound. So it was how to use sound as input into pieces. I think that first class on Skillshare is like 15,000 students. I oh, still wow. get checks from Skillshare. <laughs> so, I mean, but that was really great. I mean, it's like, you know, it's like a little bit of passive income. But then again, it's like you're also helping others, you know, to, to break into this, to this yeah. art form that I so dearly love. And, you know to have people say like, oh, you know, I found your classes, you know, X number of years ago, and I now have a career because of it. it what, what greater thing, you know, can you ask for? So, yeah, absolutely. Win-win. Uh, so you have a very peculiar and interesting approach to teaching a lot of humor and a lot of like, it's very entertaining. <laughs> um, so obviously th- yeah. that was for Schrembelder. They said that's really what motivated him to get into generative art. He's the, you're basically the person that brought him here. What other teaching experiences have you had in the past? Yeah, so I taught at School of Visual Arts for about 10 years, um, and I started with continuing education, then did undergrad, and then did graduate. Um, This year was my 17th year teaching at the Anderson Anderson Ranch uh, Art Complex in Aspen, Colorado, where I take Uh on 10 artists. This year, we did work with uh, LIDAR, so using LIDAR as input into processing. And again, it's it, they're kind of these like art retreats that kind of like allow you to kind of get out of your comfort zone, um, work with other artists, try, you know, working with a laser cutter, working with a CNC machine. So um, I've been teaching for the better part of, of 20, 20, 25 years. Very cool. Um, how do you think about the history of generative art and where we are like in the past and where we are today? Well, the funny thing is, is that uh, I think I, in my mind, I had this idea with how I thought it was going to go, right? Like, mm-hmm. and that most, I think we all can relate to this. Like, one of these days, I'm going to get a group show at a coffee shop. And then, the, then I'm going to get a solo show at a coffee shop. And then I'm going to get a group show at a gallery. Then I'm going to get a solo show at a gallery. Then I might get into a museum. And then when I'm dead, I'll be in Christie's. <laughs> <laughs> For me, it worked the exact opposite. opposite. <laughs> Which is, you know, at the time when when net art was like first coming out, uh, you know, I won the Ars Electronica Golden Nika back in 2001. Mm-hmm. I think that was kind of the first time I was em- embraced by a museum. And then I have a permanent piece in the collection of the Whitney. I've taught uh, at the MoMA here in New York. And I've shown my work almost on every museum on the planet. So I've kind of done the exact opposite because, you know, the museums don't have to worry about, you know, putting value onto a piece and selling it. They're really there to sort of ex- exhibit new experiences. And so, you know, without NFTs happening right now, honestly, I can say this like from the bottom of my heart, I never thought that we would get here. I ne- I just wow. thought we would always be on the fringe. I think the art world would ha- have always kept us at arm's length. I, I honestly thought I would die before um, I would ever get into a, a gallery scenario. And because of NFTs now, you know, now we're able to um, assign provenance. We're able to assign um, mm-hmm. collectability to something. And so it's been remarkable that I've literally gone exactly the opposite. You know, like the idea of being in Christie's and not dead is incredible. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, I think like now, if I could just get that group group show at a coffee shop, yeah, I think we can make. I think we could probably make that happen. <laughs> After people listening to this, they might hit you up then, take you up on that. Yeah. All right, so I want to dig in and talk about your project that was mm. released today on Art Blocks. It's called Organized Disruption. Uh, can yeah. you share with us your vision for this project and you know how it came? Your the idea of the project came about. So you know, I, I, I spent a lot of time looking. You know, I wanted to be very 
considerate and thorough in looking at the type of projects that were on art blocks. And one thing that I noticed was is that um, you know not only was animation subtle, but interaction was also super subtle. And so I just thought, you know, wouldn't it be interesting if I could figure out a system where what unlocked in terms of rarity was interaction? And so um, uh, at the Anderson Ranch uh, Art Complex, um, I had just kind of sorted out this idea of using like a circle, circle packing algorithm to kind of display things in a certain manner. And then the disruption would be, you know, small little things in the algorithm programmatically, but then the user. You know, like for years I've talked about, you know, that I, I like the idea that the art requires the participant. And so I thought if there was a way that I could include a lot of stuff that required the participant to interact with the work, that I, I would really have something uh, enjoyable. And so organized disruption is, is some base programming that organizes the system in a certain way. And then it's really you and your interaction that sort of disrupts that, that organization. Do you have any early prototypes of the project that you'd be able to to share with us? Yeah, I do. Let's uh, let's uh, let's look at some stuff. I think this was, I think this was build number two, and so this really uh, oh, wow. illustrates this really illustrates the the circle packing, uh -huh. and uh, it's just and so you know it would just okay. I, I'm going to build this canvas. And then, um, you know, I'm going to use circle packing to, you know, arrange it in a certain way. But I quickly realized that it didn't. So it looks best when it's, you know, when it's bubbles, when it's circles. But uh, if I could then, you know, swap it to uh, something like this, um, then. Well. Oh yeah, I forgot it's a fixed canvas. So this is the same exact uh, algorithm, except for I'm using cubes. So I just thought, mm -hmm. well, okay, I can use the initial circle packing placement of everything to to make something uh, beautiful, and then and then really go really go from there. And then uh, I got to show this one. Th this one this one is bonkers. This one is my is probably one of my favorites. Hold on one second. Oh wow! That yeah, so th I think this is like ranked number ten. <laughs> it is a real gem. So that was the, a mint the, from the, today, right? It was a mint from today. Okay. Yeah. So, so one of the rare things that could occur was um, basically uh, inverted. So instead of uh, running the color and the flow on the fills, it would run the color and the flow on strokes, and strokes are off on um on all the main ones so i think there are 25 that ended up getting this that ended up getting this property and again um you know your mouse is doing like sort of an object push it's also rotating um this one has the property of mutate so it mutates the shape into some of these kind of like little strings um so this one is a was a real was a real gem wow. and then the nice bit too is uh there was also uh, let me just see if I can find it here. Um, it's going to be number. Hold on, I'm almost there. So this is another like, I, I got to tell this story. So, uh, I love Jeff. I love you, Jeff. But <laughs> Jeff was like, he's like, you know, the feedback is is that some of these are like really stroby, and like <laughs> one person I think wrote on the Discord like. This hurts my eyes. I need to go lay down. And I was like, I really, I really like that you've had that the experience. That, uh, that experience. <laughs> and so I was like, okay. Uh, I was like, okay, Jeff. I'll, I'll totally tone down the strobing of the, of the colors. And so I, I put in a, a secret bit of code that, that every 100 mints, so 100, 200, 300, 400, 500, 600, 700, 800, and 900 would unlock this. And then on Rinkaby. I only minted up to 70. So, uh, so, so Jeff would never see this. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I kind of, Jeff, Jeff, I love you, but I, <laughs> but I, I snuck this in. So there are nine of these like kind of ultra rares that unlock their own secret color set 
and they really do this kind of what I call disco inferno. Uh, that's super cool. Are there any so other features it. that you were worried wouldn't show, but they ended up, you know, coming through the mentor anyways? Um, you know, the, the, the probability was, uh, oh, here's a, here's a surprise one. So, um, the first three color sets, I had weighted them so that they would be kind of rare to get. So I think like color set one had a probability of like 4% and set two had a probability of like 7% and set three had a probability of like 10%. But it ended up that more hit set one than I think like color set two or three. So oh, if you wow. actually look at the rarity, uh, uh, set, color set two and three happened rarer than color set one, one did, which was which was completely, you know, that's that's RNG for you. That's awesome. That's super cool. Yeah, can you do you mind actually talking to us a little bit about the palettes? You know, as far as like how you selected them and how you put those together. Yeah. So color has been kind of a big thing for me uh, for, for years. And it's been one of the classes that I taught like super early, which was color tricks. And uh, what I usually end up doing is, is saving color as um, I'm going to, I'm going to take this one away. Cause it's too, it's too crazy. <laughs> yeah. Jeff might be turning off. the, the <laughs> yeah, episode by yeah. now, so. Jeff is just like, okay, cool. Uh, <laughs> yeah, let, let's put this one back on just cause it's so, so incredible. So color, um, I usually do inside of Illustrator, and I've been doing them as gradients uh, PNGs. So uh, I would have it fade, like I would start with one color at the beginning, and then have it fade to a color, fade to a color. And I was literally for 20, 22 years, 20 years, building these color tables as PNGs. And so I was, I had picked like, like 10 of kind of like my favorite color sets that I've been, you know, using over, you know, the past 20 years or so. And here's the funny bit is uh um i was like okay well i'll just take these pngs and then i'll just rip them out as arrays and so uh i had these like 10 arrays that were 900 sub items and so i i think when i was building my file like my sketch was like 120k and then i get this message from jeff he's like you know like uh art block should be like around 5 or 20k and i was like Oh my God, what am I going to do? Like, and I was already kind of like halfway through uh, working this way. And so um, this is where LERP color uh, really comes in handy. And so I ended up uh, using LERP to kind of do the same exact thing where I would basically pick like, I would take like five or six colors out of these PNGs and then use LERP to build the tables, uh, the tables for me. Very cool. So, yeah. So, there's, I mean, everyone's got to know this, but a whopping 65 ETH from this project was donated to processing. Can you tell us a little bit why you chose processing as a charity foundation and organization to donate to? Yeah. So as of today, it was 68 ETH. 68. And, you know, as of today, it's $221,000. Wow. Um, I'm seriously like over the moon. And, and, but look at, so let's just look at what the universe has done. The universe has done this. It made Casey Reese my coworker back in 1999. I literally watch him go to MIT, met, meet Ben Fry. They literally create processing. Flash dies. And I'm like, well, it's only natural for me to, to move to processing. And processing has given me my career, like for the past 10 or 11 or 15 years. I mean, I'm bad with time. <laughs> but it literally has given me my career, right? And so... Not only is it giving me my career, but a couple of days ago, it's processing's 20th year anniversary. Yeah. So it just, it made absolute sense that, that, you know, not only was this the type of project that really helps people get into programming for the very first time, you know, it's, it's not like getting into C or C++ or GLSL, you know, it really is kind of the gateway drug into generative art. And so it only made perfect sense that I would have this kind of history with processing, this history with Casey, this history with it being the tool that has given me, you know, some of the greatest projects that, that I've ever worked on. So it only made sense. And I'm just, I'm over the moon to make that donation today. That's very cool. Totally Congra thrilled. Congratulations on that. I think that's such an awesome I thing have, to do. I have everybody to thank for, for, you know, loving this project and it never would have happened without the community. Excellent. Uh, do you have any other projects listed on any other platforms or any other upcoming events that you want to share with the community? 
Yeah, so I mean, I'm on uh, Mountain Foundation. I've done just like a few kind of weird sketches there. Um, my first NFTs were on Super Rare, but those are kind of my one of ones, and those are uh, processing. It's this weird hybrid, like Ant to Gradle to Java to processing to GLSL. They're really this kind of mutant way of working um, that I've that I've kind of really uh, nailed over the past couple of years. And those get rendered to MP4s. So those, those super rares are kind of outputs of those kind of moments of time. Um, and then obviously I had that Christie's drop, which was super exciting. Um, but my next big thing is I'm actually having a, a solo show um, at the end of October at uh, the, a gallery in Los Angeles called Seasons. And we're going to take the gallery and we're going to split it into two. There's going to be a dark side and a light side. And the dark side will be the you know, generative algorithms running in real time. And then the light side is I'm going to be outputting these to to actual like full scale uh, paintings. So cool. uh, I've got a bunch of wide format printers in my studio, and um, I've just been running like these are printed on canvas. So this is you know processing and GLSL uh, to canvas, and then I'm gonna you know get back to to painting on top of these. So that's Beautiful. kind of like my next big project until the end of October. That's awesome. Cool. We look forward to, uh, yeah, if you have any information, if you wouldn't mind sharing that with us in the, in the Factor channel in general, I think some people might be interested in checking it out. Absolutely. Yeah, I'll post that stuff uh, as soon as it gets, it gets more real. Cool. That sounds good. And then what is one piece of advice you'd want to give someone who wants to become a generative artist? I think uh, one is, is that you have to surround yourself with... Uh, smarter people in the room. You know, there were some real key people in my career. Um, back in the flash days, I had a guy named Brandon Hall. And today I've got a really dear friend named Ben Fox. And both of those people are smarter than me. They're, they're, they're people who I can ask questions to. And I think the big piece of advice that I would give is, is like seek out people that you can ask help for. Like it's okay to not know what you're doing. And um, asking people for help is, um, is, is what I've done for, you know, 20, 25 years. And it's, it's helped me become a, a better person. And then I would also say that, you know, the type of work you make is the type of work you should make. And um, uh, there's never going to be an auto kick ass button. So, you know, today, today is the day to kick ass, yeah, you know. Absolutely. And I, I find that all the obstacles that I face are self-imposed. There, there are things that I put in front of myself, like, oh, I can't do this. Yeah. By saying, oh, I can't do this, like I've, or, I've guaranteed that I can't do it. So it's those kind of, those kind of lessons that have taken me like, you know, 25 years to learn. Very cool. And then, do you have any social media plugs? Any other information that you want to provide with the community? No, I hate social media. <laughs> I, we're getting off of it. I'm on your Discord channel. Please talk to me <laughs> on Discord. Uh, I mean, obviously, I'm on Twitter. I'm on Instagram. But you know, it's like the, the the more I participate in communities on Discord, just you know, find me on Discord. I you know, I love helping people. I'm constantly posting samples on Pastebin. You know, because if I don't do that, I'm just going to sit here and play video games. So, <laughs> I'm on Discord. Chat with me on the Art Blocks Discord, please. Sounds good. Well, we appreciate it, Josh. Thank you so much for being here, aka PlayStation. Uh, thank you for being on tonight's episode. Uh, up next, I want to bring on Noel Flicker. How's hey it going? Man. How you doing? Good. How are you? I'm doing yeah. excellent. Thank you so much for being on this evening. Uh, yeah, I want to get right into it. Uh, how did you get into NFTs, crypto, and then you know eventually art blocks? So I have like the antithesis story of of Josh <laughs> as far as I'm I'm a way late. <laughs> way late to the party um couldn't have a more diverse uh background so i'd always heard about crypto kind of followed it in the background never really participated uh and then earlier this year i said you know what i'm gonna start to really learn about it uh and then soon after obviously nfts were blowing up so started to learn about nfts and uh working in the hosting industry like domain and hosting industry i see how temporary things are People say, oh, if it's on the internet, it's always going to be there. And time and time again, I see that's simply not true. <laughs> so I'm like, I, I don't like NFTs until I learned about art blocks. So Very cool. And did you know yeah. about generative art prior to art blocks? Uh, a little bit. Not much, though. 
right? So uh, one of the things that I was always fascinated with kind of growing up and stuff was like the small coding challenges that people would do or code, code golf, right? So I looked at code on some level as art for what they were creating, a lot different than the, than the generative art that we see here. Um, but it was really the code that I was always fascinated by. So when I found art blocks mixed with small code, I was, I was blown away. Nice. And then was there a specific project on art blocks that, you know, spoke to you and you're like, all right, this is going to be something special. Yeah, there was a couple, right? So I, I think 720 minutes, uh, blew my mind, uh, on many levels, right? Like I'm like, wait, it's a clock. Yeah. And it's a different, and it tells time <laughs> and then it has a magic moment. Like I was blown away. And then, uh, algorithms was the other one that when I first, when I first started, I'm like, oh, that's, that's unbelievable the way this is working. Yeah, I agree. That's awesome. So you are a part of the Artblocks Wiki team. Uh, I just want to know, like, how did the Wiki get started? Yeah, so I joined the community, and I was like, I want to be able to contribute. And, and I'm not sure how, but I just, I, I love the community so much. And I saw D. Bachman say, hey, I want to start a Wiki. Someone DM me if they want to do it with me. So I'm like, hey, let's do it, right? And so he's like, great, we, we have it set up. Uh, Andrew had had propped something up on one of his own personal domains, and he was like, uh, "You guys can use this." And so then, at that point, I was like, "What what do we want to create?" Right? It, like it was it was I think Steve Bachman had made a page about Chromies and kind of an overview page, and that, and and that was about it, right? Like the squiggles and the overview page, and he, and so we just started there. Nice. And and what's yeah. the purpose of the artblocks.wiki page? Yeah, it's, it's really twofold. It's to celebrate the art and the artist, right? So uh, the art that comes out, people always have questions. Um, it's always funny in the Discord. It seems like once a week there's someone that goes, wait, 720 minutes is a clock, right? Like they just, they, they don't know things. <laughs> they don't know, say, yeah, exactly. Wait, squiggles change color, right? Like, what, what do you mean? And so we wanted to be able to quickly send people to explore the art more to see the interactivity, to, to understand what it is, and then also the artists, right? To understand more about who the people are that are making these things. Yeah, absolutely. And, and who's helping you, you know, helping with the, the wiki page itself? Yeah, totally. So we, uh, it started off as, as D. Bachman and we, we got a channel quickly spun up because we were, we were blowing up each other on DM. <laughs> uh, and so we got a channel made. And so now, uh, like it's D. Bachman, Decipher 2021 has been good. Freak Lion is helping out. Row Heavy has done some great uh, CSS coding to help us make it look a little better. Nice. Uh, David All and then Scudetto, I believe is how you say it. I probably butchered it. He sent me a little file to play it, but <laughs> uh, so so that's the team right now. Uh, but it's going uh, it's going super good, and it's fun to watch everyone kind of say, "Hey, I have this idea," and it's like, "Let's <laughs> try it. Let's yeah. try it. Let's go." Right? Like it's it's been good. Yeah, I think it's such a it's such a great resource because like you said, you know, there's some older projects that people don't know how to interact with them or that, you know, that you can interact with it, that it has sound, that it has, it acts as a clock. And I think that's yeah. so important. It gets lost in all these conversations that we're having on Discord. And it's so great to have, you know, that central resource where everything just kind of lives. Um, yeah. One of the things that, that we noticed quickly early on was everyone was like, wait, what projects in what season? were curated yeah right everyone was obsessed we're <laughs> season one we're season two and, and there was no easy way to find it right so we're like hey let's make a page that kind of just lists out what seasons are which so we can just send it to people uh, and they can they can browse to their heart's content on it right so it's it's really trying to find those those easy wins of frequently asked questions to to help educate people absolutely and then what's the like the roadmap or what's next for the wiki page yeah, so so a couple things we're working on right now. I don't. The, the goal when we started was like, we got to get projects listed, right? So it was just we were like, my family was gone. I had some vacation, and I was just like, let's make pages. So every day I was just cranking out pages to try. I was trying to um, catch up to Casey's launch actually, like launch one hundred. I wanted to be done uh -huh. before, but before that, and so I was just I was just busting it out trying to get it done. And so we got them all out there. Uh, but now it's making them look good, right? So the information's there. I think there's a way to really make it better. Um, and then artist pages, right? We have some artist pages that are fantastic. We're missing a lot of artists, though. Yeah. 
Gotcha. Okay, yeah. cool. And then, you know, how can people join in to help out? Because obviously this is a very much a community resource, but then also it's created by the community. Like how, mm-hmm. how do people get involved if they want to help out? It's super simple. There's a, there's a Discord channel called Community Wiki. Come in there and, and say hi and say, hey, guys, I have this idea. Or I want to help edit and I want to help change things. Um, we've had people come in and say, I don't know how to do any of this. Can I write a Word doc for what I want to do? And absolutely, let's do it. Right? They send us, they send us a Google doc. We convert it, put it on a page for them, and they're, and they're good to go. We have other people like the, like the team right now that are like, no, I want to help. I want to make this great. Right? And so, so they come in and they say, hey, I found this. Let's do this. Or, hey, this date published. Let's do this. Right? So it's, it's a lot of fun. Very cool. And then what's your favorite part of the wiki page? I know you have your shared screen pulled up. Maybe we can take a look and, and you can point out some of the cool features that the site has to offer. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, so a couple things. One thing that we we're just starting to work on right now uh, on the upcoming page for people, we have it for scribbled boundaries right now, is a little link to either an iCal or Outlook calendar. So if you want to add one of the upcoming projects to your calendar, you're able to do that quickly. Um, working on it for G Calendar as well. Uh, community content page is huge. It's got so many tips and tricks for people. Uh, Freak Lion actually today made a glossary, right? Because we hear people say hams on there. We hear people say all sorts of stuff, right? Like perfect spectrum, right? Like people are like, what are you talking about? So we made a glossary. Um, there's, uh, there's tips for printing every day. We have people come in and say, I want to print this. How do I do it? Right? Uh, wallpaper screensaver tools. I, I know you've seen those evangelized out there, right? So yeah. <laughs> people are like, what are you talking about? Um, so this, this gives a really good overview of all the tools that are available. And then obviously we have people come in and say, I want to learn how to do this. I love what these guys are doing. Like, where do I even start? Mm-hmm. And so this page was put together. Uh, and it's just a ton of resources and classes. Like, here's Josh's class. Um, tons of classes and books available um, for people who want to really understand how to code and how to do it. That's awesome. That's super yeah. cool. And then what about, you know, some of these artists, you know, un- under the, the project pages itself, there's information, there's like fun facts, basically. Oh, Can you yeah. kind of, yeah, I think that's such a cool highlight because a lot of times you've actually reached out to the artist be like, hey, what's a fun fact about this project while you're designing or creating it? Absolutely, and I know we I know we talked about this one last week in the in the um like in the, oh, the trivia. trivia yeah yeah but but one of the things we were just in Max chat he was talking about all of the circles they used right and so he's talking about oh uh, void has you know like up to seventy five hundred circles messengers has one point two million circles uh, and actually they're not circles. He's like, don't tell anyone, but they're 60 sided polygons, right? Yeah. So, so, and I'm like, oh my gosh, that's amazing. Both the 1.2 million in messengers, uh, but that they're also 60 sided polygons. Yeah. And it's just little things like that um, that are so fun to share with people, right? Because then, then people zoom in, they zoom in, wait, and they're like, wait, I see that it's not a perfect circle, right? Yeah. Like it's, it's super fun to, to get them to explore. I think that's super cool. Well, thank you so much for talking to us about the artblocks.wiki website. I highly recommend it. You know, obviously, if you want to, when we have these trivia questions for giveaways of the Chromey Squiggle, 99% of the time, they're probably going to come from that website. So I highly recommend checking that out. Uh, Before we finish up with you, uh, I just want to ask, you know, what do you love most about the Artblocks community? It's... uh it's a community, right? Like it, it reminds me uh, personally. So uh, growing, I, I grew up in Phoenix, right? And, and it reminds me weirdly of like the, the punk scene in like the early to mid nineties, as far as like you would go to shows and the art and, and the artists that were on stage would come around and hang out and walk and, and hang out with everyone. Right. And you would be like, no, you're doing amazing stuff. And they're just, they're just hanging out, having a good time with everyone. Right. And so seeing the artists interact, seeing the artists have fun, seeing the artists answer questions for people, whether it's technical or about the artwork specifically, um, really brings the community together. And, and another great example was even today, someone came in and said, hey, I'm thinking about buying this piece. Do you guys think it's a good deal? It's my first piece on Artblocks. Is it a good deal? And three or four people chimed in and they said, 
hey, that's a cool piece, but have you thought about this? Have you thought about this? Why don't you hang out and find the piece that really talks to you? And the guy was yeah. like, wow, this community's amazing, right? Like, no one's making fun of me. No one's saying, yeah, do it. Don't do it. It's horrible, whatever. Like, it was really an education thing. that, And that, that's what's, what, what drew me in when I, when I first got here, too. That's super cool. That's awesome. And then what would, you, what would be a piece of advice? You know, you're talking about somebody that was new on Art Blocks. What would be one piece of advice that you give a new collector on Art Blocks? Uh, be well learn so, so there's a couple right so one <laughs> one's learn I, I know when when i first got in it was i was like a kid in a candy store right i was like oh my gosh every piece is is unbelievable my wallet doesn't support every piece being unbelievable i don't know what to do i'll get my wife mad at me right for for buying more than she wants me to buy but that's okay we'll figure that out uh, but it's really learn right and as you start to learn and understand really what it is how it's different from a lot of the other stuff on OpenSea, how it's, how it's on chain, understand what that is. Understand what the artists are doing and how it's created. You, you get a whole level of appreciation for, for what it really is and what it's really about. Mm -hmm. Excellent. No, I 100% I agree. Well, I just want to thank you so much, Noel Flicker, for A, providing us information, helping out with this artblocks.wiki page and website. I think it's so cool and so necessary for everyone in the community. And yeah, just thank you so much for also being a community leader. You were just, I think you just joined the team yesterday, if I'm not mistaken. And I just want to thank you so much for helping us out and the community out. I think it's totally necessary and it's just very appreciated. Oh, no, no problem at all. It's been, it's been a, a few short months, but it's been a wild ride. So, so definitely, yeah. uh, definitely enjoying it. Yeah. Well, we appreciate you. Um, so the, for, up for the next segment, I have uh, our weekly Love to See It highlights of the week. I'm just going to highlight three different things that have been really positive in the, or, yeah, positive in the community and just want to share it with everyone. Uh, so the first one is from Eliastine, who is an artist on Artblocks. They are raising money for some causes that they care about and something that we all, actually all benefit from. So they're auctioning off mint number 26 for, from their incantation uh, project and proceeds will go to EEF and for folks that are not familiar with the Electronics Frontier Foundation they kind of act like the ACLU of the digital world they fight against censorship and uh, for net neutrality and also provide pro bono representation for some high profile cases um, for the second one it's from Freakline they want to nominate D Bachman, Noel Flicker, Andrew, Decipher 2021 and everyone else from the Artblocks wiki team who are absolutely killing it on the community wiki. So props to all you for helping out with that. It's much appreciated. And for the third and final love to see it highlight of the week, it's from uh, Toe Brizzle who wants to nominate West Staphylopoulos for encouraging all of us to stay safe and link things up with hardware wallets and make sure we're all being smart. Uh, they inspired Toe Brizzle to up their game and it looks like they also watched the After Dinner Mint episode seven featuring purplehat.eth, aka Jake Rockland, who also learned a great deal of information about security. And they still have, and you know, if uh, Toe Brizzle had some extra questions and Purple Hat was uh, super helpful, you know, today even to give information to, or, yeah, give time to connect and help out with any questions that they had. So props to all the people that have been really supportive and looking after one another in the community. And yeah, I want to move it on to Snowfro and see if he has any news and notes. Hey, Did you have anything on? Uh, yeah, not, nothing, nothing too great or nothing too big. Just uh, really excited <laughs> to have, uh, um, you know, getting pretty close to bringing on a couple more really talented uh, team members uh, for our blocks that are, I think, going to revolutionize our tech side. So. Uh, really excited about that. Um, excited to make announcements on that here in the next few weeks. And uh, yeah, no, I appreciate everybody's patience with all of the um, daily surprises that we are experiencing on the Artblocks platform. Uh, never a dull moment. Uh, but yeah, no, thank you. Thank you uh, to everybody out there. And man, uh, the Wiki team, uh, just man, yeah. Wow, thank you. And do you want to mention anything about the, the, the squiggles? Because obviously, so this is pre-recorded for anyone that's 
currently watching. Do we want to talk about that or I can bring it up? Yeah. Later. So, yeah, I mean, uh, what we're going to do um, in, in light of kind of what, what happened uh, with, um, you know, uh, the hack of the crypto Venetians project, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to pre mint a bunch of squiggles for the next few after dinner mints. I know it's not nearly as exciting as like watching it being minted in public. Uh, and then I'm going to send uh, the artist address to cold storage. And so uh, along with all of my R block pieces, all of my punks, all of my autoglyphs, and all of my other NFTs, um, it would take me a significant amount of time to recover them. And I hate to do it. I really love having access to my squiggles, but things have gotten to a point where uh, it is not just for the best of the squiggles, but also for the best of the platform that, you know, we just go out of our way to super secure our stuff. So um, we've gone through some security hardening in the last couple of weeks for our blocks, and we will continue doing that um, even more now. Uh, and I don't think you can ever be too safe or ever be too secure. And that's, that's, that's at least my reasoning for uh, doing what we're doing. So they'll come back, uh, but they won't come back unless there's some kind of really solid, secure way to mint these uh, that doesn't just rely on one person uh, being compromised. So, yeah. Cool. Very awesome. Appreciate that. Uh, so for next week's show, we're going to have, which will be on August 22nd, we're actually going to have Casey Reese and Ben Fry on uh, to help wow. celebrate 20 years of processing. I think that'll be a fantastic episode and something I'm, I think a lot of us are going to be looking forward to. Uh, and then on top of that, you know, comment, like, subscribe to the Artblocks, Artblocks YouTube channel. Make sure to check us on the Discord. There's a link inside of the YouTube description if you want to jump on, say hello. You know, we'll get you in the right direction, point you in the right direction, whether you're an artist, future collector, or just want to learn about generative art. Uh, but yeah, that's all from myself. I want to thank all of our guests for being on this evening, for Snowfro, for creating this incredible platform. We appreciate you. Uh, PlayStation, aka Josh Davis, thank you so much for providing us information about your project today and then, you know, talking about your history, all you've done to support Generative Art in the past. And then also Null Flicker, again, for, you know, their Artblocks Wikipedia, uh, Wikipedia page uh, for helping, you know, support and, you know, provide information for everyone in the community. And that's all, that's about it for me. I want to thank everyone again for tuning in for another week of After Dinner Mints. Uh, be kind to each other, and we will see everyone next week. Have a good night, everyone.